Our mm -hmm. next speaker is going to be Junji Wee, and um, he's going to talk about mathematical AI for molecular sciences. Please go ahead, uh, Junji. Uh, I see that you have mute yourself. I cannot hear you. Yeah. So sorry about that. It works for me here as well. Yeah, I start the video. So sorry about that. Yeah. So, yeah. So the whole so the whole so the whole game that we are playing about this uh, mathematical AI for molecular sciences is to combine the uh, these three areas. So basically, the the with the um uh huge amount of uh, biological material chemistry data that we that we have nowadays we want to we want to co incorporate some of these uh, mathematical concepts and also a lot of these are uh, powerful learning models so with this uh, huge amount of data we also have a lot of uh, for example here just emphasize some of these uh, biological data banks so so the first one that we have is the protein data bank. So it's uh, steadily uh, collecting a lot of proteins uh, uh, annually, and by and and as of uh, as of now, there's about uh, at least a hundred ninety-two thousand were protein structures in there. So there's a lot of uh, 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 structures that people can use for all kinds of uh, study and mathematical computations and, and and things like that. And also the other data bank is the gene data bank. So there's also about more than 220 million uh, gene sequences inside there. So previously in the 1990s, it's about, uh, it takes about 100 million to be able to uh, 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 decode this gene, gene sequence. But nowadays it's uh, getting uh, more and more, more and more cheaper. And with the amount, with the rise in the computational power, then uh, things like our smartphone, our, our computational devices, the amount of, uh, Virtual, uh, virtual technology that we need uh, now these days is uh, also uh, more, uh, more readily available, and we can also uh, make use of the computational power to compute uh, many of these uh, mathematical concepts that we that we can incorporate into to to help in this uh, bio solve these biological and applications. So what we also so. So what we also have is a powerful learning models. Uh, many people have also have been using uh, machine learning algorithms, statistical learning, and recently uh, alpha 2 has uh, has uh, made quite a breakthrough in this uh, protein folding problem. So this is also uh, using the DeepMind. Uh, uh, deep, uh, they work with this uh, DeepMind, and which is also a part of this uh, uh, AlphaGo project and stuff like that. And also recently, uh, DeepMind also worked with, uh, collaborated with uh, this uh, uh, this group of uh, mathematical researchers in uh, formulating, in using AI to formulate uh, new theories in knots and uh, combinatorics and algebra. So, so with this uh, with these uh, three major advancements, uh, what uh, what what we see in this uh, in from the chemical from the chemical descriptors project, this is that they actually uh, built quite a huge amount of uh, uh, chemical descriptors. So these chemical descriptors are used to uh, are used to represent uh, molecules for future learning. So this uh, brings into the whole uh, into the whole area about the molecular molecular representation and featureization uh, 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 again. So what we so what they have is that they also have all these common chemical descriptors that are for this QSAR uh, analysis, which I stands for quantitative structural uh, activity relationship or quantity structural property relationship, and 
and and what and what these descriptors uh consist of is actually basically taking into account the topology and geometry of these uh, uh, uh molecular structures so for example in these zero dimensional descriptors they are just basically counting the atoms bonds uh, uh accounting for the weights of, of, of these molecules. And then in the one dimensional is the chemical graph uh, descriptors, which is uh, trying to uh, count the functional groups. And then moving into higher dimensions is to more into this uh, global topology and geometry aspect, which is about the Wiener indices, autocorrelations, autocorrelation uh, 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 attributes. So, so this has accumulated a huge amount of uh, chemical descriptors in the in the current uh, molecular uh, data representation uh, uh, platform. But then, uh, as a math as a mathematician, we want to ask ourselves like, is there the is there some of these key key descriptors that actually are, are effectively uh, uh, responsible for this uh, for these machine learning models to work? work very well in their in their in, in in their prediction in their prediction problems. So this immediately we think about in terms of uh, mathematics, in terms of geometry and topology, we think about TDA because it's one of the uh, uh, popular popular applications in 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 this current in, in this current in, during our time. And so this this is all about the topological invariant, homology, homotopy. And so this is essentially all about the counting of these uh, Betty numbers. So for example, if we put in our DNA structures, our proteins, our, vi our virus capsid structures, we are effectively just uh, redu uh, redu reducing it to just counting the number of loop structures and the cavities and connected components in these, uh, in these uh, in these molecular structures in there. So, so, so in order to do that, we have to construct, uh, we have to consider a, a point cloud data from our molecular structure, and we can construct uh, all kinds of simplicial com complex, uh, common co simplicial complex being a alpha complex or Victoria strips complex. And, and thereafter we construct the, we, we, we do some uh, coding and then we construct the relevant uh, algebraic topological groups and then we can extract the Betty numbers from there. So that so with that, this TDA actually can calculate this essential topological information from, from one particular simplicial complex itself. And what this TDA actually does is to, to, to not just compute one, uh, simplicial complex from each molecule structure, but for each molecule structure, we put it through a filtration process. So we have this uh, changing simplicial complex that uh, that keeps adding uh, simplices as the uh, as we increase this uh, filtration parameter f. So this filtration parameter can be your distance parameter, whereby this distance between any two any two any two uh, uh, vertices. And then we will connect them subsequently, and so and so with that, this TD, with with, with this filtration process, we actually generate this uh, persistent barcode diagram, and in this persistent barcode diagram, we can discretize this uh, barcode diagram. So we using this discretization, we we effectively are just counting the number of bars at every at every interval, and this uh and and. And this is what we call a binning method, and we actually can can form this uh, long feature vector here, which uh, which uh, accounts for the topological fingerprint of this uh, of this molecular structure. And so there are, and so there many people have been working in this uh, TDA area, and many people have been using all all this so all these softwares. Uh, Softwares that are readily available in uh, MATLAB, R, Python, and and this and and this has been used in uh, many applications now. So so in order to bring this TDA into this biomolecular data, one of the early works is to is to 
is to is to be able to interpret these uh, topological barcodes in this uh, in one of the uh, simple uh, biomolecular structures and one of the biomolecular structures and there is uh, also simple but also interesting is the Fullerene structure which was also uh, mentioned by Bobo just now. So this topological fingerprint actually actually effectively em embeds all the all the much needed topological information of this fullerene. For example, in this uh, petty zero bars, we can see that there are some that are short, some that are long. This is actually uh, accounting for the single bonds and the double bonds of this uh, fullerene structure. And then in this petty one, we have some short bars and some long bars as well. This, the, this is actually counting the number of pentagons and hexagons that are in this fullerene structure. So this is actually effectively uh, taking into account the, the cycle or loop structures that are one dimensional homologies. And in this, uh, and for Betty 2 is effectively counting the, this uh, cavity or void structure that is, uh, uh, that, that appears uh, some, somewhere uh, after the, uh, in the, somewhere after the Betty 1 bars. So this topological barcode for this fullerene has meaning, and, and it also has meaning in some of these uh, uh, basic uh, biomolecular structures as well. So here we have the alpha helix, alpha helix uh, beta barrel uh, DNA structures. And so in this alpha helix structure, what we, what we can do is that we can actually slice this, uh, this uh, helical structure into pieces and we can see that actually the topological fingerprint actually uh, consistently uh, progresses accordingly to these, uh, to these uh, alpha helix uh, slices. And also in this beta barrel, we have this large cylindrical structure in, in it. Uh, we can see that the, uh, the, there is this uh, large cycle that will be formed uh, somewhere about five angstroms. So this, uh, this is what we can observe from these Betty 1 bars. And for this DNA structure, we actually have this, uh, we actually have this uh, double helical structure here. So some of these uh, ATGC are actually some of these sugarine structures or these amino acids. They are actually small little compounds that are actually within, they are actually within each of these helical structures here. Which is what we call this. Uh, which is actually uh, some uh, local properties, local topological properties that will appear in this uh, topological fingerprint, and then some of these connections that are between these two uh, helical structures are actually one of these uh, global connection properties. So when we remove, try to remove some uh, of these hydrogen atoms because uh, these structures use tend to have. Uh, a lot of hydrogen atoms. When we remove them, we can actually see, see them clearer in the Betty 1 bars. So there are some bars that actually appear uh, uh, slightly earlier in the, in the barcode. And then there are some bars that actually appear uh, much later. So the, those that appear earlier are, due, are the local topological properties that are due to these amino acids. And then those that are the global properties are those that appeared much later, which is due to the, which is uh, when the uh, helical structures actually start to connect to each other. So this actually, uh, this topological fingerprint has been uh, effective for, for all these biomolecular structures. And so with that, we can actually form, this forms a general pipeline in, uh, in TDA-based uh, machine learning models. So basically people extract the Betty numbers or barcodes from the persistent diagram. And people, from there, people can generate all sorts of forms of uh, features uh, from, from this uh, persistent barcode. So now we not just have a topological fingerprint or a barcode or a, or a long feature vector. Now we also can convert it to a persistent image or even a persistent landscape. So this, so this also helps in, uh, use, in using TDA into some of this unsupervised and supervised learning. So we have all sorts of uh, 
uh, learning models now and they and and some of these models requires uh, image input some of these some of these uh, models uh, are using a uh, uh, feature factors uh, long uh, time series data and things like that so this this uh, this is a uh, uh, convenient and versatile for these uh, machine learning models so one of the key motivations into tapping into this uh, TDA is also due to the success of this TDA based machine learning models for drug design. So uh, Professor Wei's group from Michigan State has also worked a, a lot on building these TDA machine learning models for this uh, molecular property prediction. So what they do is that they build all these models and participate in this uh, D3R grand challenge, which is like some Olympics competition in this uh, TDA, in this uh, mo uh, molecular property prediction uh, uh, field, and what they have, what they have achieved is that they have, uh, they have managed to use TDA-based machine learning and and achieve uh, 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 many medals in this uh, D3R Grand Challenge, as you can see here, and also in successive years, and also in different categories as well. So, so what we, so what they have is that they actually uh, try to use these TDA machine learning models to predict uh, different, uh, different properties such as binding affinities, which is, uh, uh, for, which is actually essentially just uh, predicting the strength of the, of the, of the binding interactions between uh, two, two molecular structures. And also some of these, uh, so what, and also some of these are the solvation energy or the toxicity prediction and things like that. But what essentially what they have shown is that they are, the TDA-based machine learning model, which is in these uh, all these bars that are in red here, they are actually have a higher Pearson correlation than the rest of the models in blue, which are some of the, some of them are traditional molecular models, and also it has a and also their model have a higher RMSE compared to the TDA-based machine learning model. So this brings a lot of success to this uh, in this uh, research field. And so essentially what we want to build upon it is to have a more advanced mathematical representation and this intrinsic invariant from this uh, multi-scale simplicial complex. So using that, we not just want to extract the system homology, but now we can think about extracting other types of uh, invariants from this, uh, from this uh, filtration process. So effectively, what we are trying to have now is a persistent function-based machine learning model. So from the topological perspective, uh, we, we already have the homology Euler characteristics as the intrinsic uh, descriptors. But from the geometrical perspective, uh, we, also want to, we also want to construct a a curvature based a machine learning model. So what we what we are thinking about is the Ricci curvature, Gaussian curvature, and 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 maybe possibly the other curvatures that also uh, mentioned by Bobo just now. But what we have done is to what we have done is that we have we have uh, successfully applied this uh, Oliver Rich curvature and this Forman Rich curvature into these uh, biomolecular systems. So we so for each molecular structure, we we can con we can assign a certain value to these uh, vertices and these edges and these tri triangles, and and this allows us to embed and, and embed uh, effectively encode this uh, geometrical information from this uh, from this uh, uh, curvature based uh, uh, model. So this is also due to the. Uh, Huge popularity here, right? Uh, some of um, uh, some, uh, I, I, many of these, uh, many of these uh, authors are also in this conference, uh, in this week. Uh, so uh, like uh, Jürgen uh, Mazia, also working on this uh, Ricci curvature for these hypergraphs, and also, and also there, are, uh, some have even given the, the their their talks yesterday, and also. And also there is also uh, 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 the former Ricci curvature, which has also a lot of applications uh, recently. I think Yogan, Yogan Yoss also uh, has, uh, 
has a has a work on the formal Ricci curvature in these uh, autism spectral disorder applications, and 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 this Ricci curvature and this Ricci curvature also connects back to Ricci flow, and also part of this Poincaré conjecture, which is which 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 bring a lot of promise promising to this uh, to this research field. So what we want to uh, develop is if essentially to introduce this uh, persistence into this uh, Ricci curvature. So not just having a Ricci curvature, but also to introduce this persistence. But first for this, between this Oliver and Foreman Ricci curvature, the Oliver Ricci curvature is defined on graphs and the Foreman Ricci curvature is defined on a for a higher order com uh, complexes. So, but here we just define it for spatial complex. And for this Oliver Ricci curvature, uh, we can also associate the, uh, the uh, positive zero and negative curvature in the form of graphs. Uh, I think some of this is also, uh, also mentioned by the uh, Popo just now. Uh, positive curvature is uh, easily, easily easily related to these uh, complete graphs. The zero curvature is uh, related to these infinite grid graphs. And this uh, negative curvature exists on this uh, dumbbell type of situation with these uh, three graphs. So this is actually uh, uh, associated in this discrete setting uh, compared to this uh, Gaussian curvature where we have this uh, sphere cylinder and this uh, saddle point for this uh, continuous setting. So what we can do is to put this uh, curvature stuff, compute this curvature stuff in these biomolecular systems and see how they actually represent our biomolecular systems with this uh, geometrical information. So what we have seen or also uh, seen in other works is that uh, positive curvature tends to appear on these uh, communities within these uh, structures. And these negative curvatures are usually this uh, on these uh, linking regions between these communities. So we have, so although the two curvatures are formulated very differently, but we have seen this uh, as a common, as a, as a common, uh, as a common observation between the two of them. So here we have a, a protein and a DNA, and we have also seen uh, uh, this, uh, uh, similar characteristics on both curvatures. So the Oliver Ricci curvature is the uh, is is uh, computed based on the L1 Wasserstein distance. Uh, here we use the Oliver Ricci curvature with idealness, which means that for what we do is that we effectively for each uh, vertex on a certain graph, we actually assign we assign a certain mass here on. On, on X and we distribute it to these neighbors of X. So here we consider a curvature with idealness. So we actually have this alpha probability whereby, the, whereby this alpha of this mass will, will, be, will, 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 will not be distributed to its neighbors and will stay with the vertex X. And so using this uh, distribution, so we can actually compute this uh, persistent distance between uh, the mass of uh, two, two vertices. So effectively, this is uh, trying to find the minimum transportation distance that can that that can balance the mass between uh, the two the two vertices on the two vertices. So what we have is a simple example here. Don't want to go into the details. I think many of many of the experts are are here today, and so the Wasserstein distance is just. Uh, Take, uh, comparing them and taking the difference essentially, and and from there we can actually compute this uh, Oliver Ricci curvature using this uh, formula given here. And so for this Foreman Ricci curvature is a more combinatorial one. Uh, so here we actually compute the triangles, faces, whole faces, and uh, parallel parallel uh, parallel simplices. So here is actually a more of a counting, counting function. So, yeah. And so with that, we, with both types of curvatures, we can actually effectively track the changes of these curvatures using this uh, persistence 
by introducing this persist persistence in this filtration process. So on the top row, we actually track the changes in the uh, vertex curvature. Second row, we track the changes in the edge curvature. And the third row, we track the changes in the uh, uh, triangles. And so what we so what we have is a, a distribution, a curvature distribution for every value of, for every instance f of the parameter. And so we can aggregate these distributions by taking uh, several st statistics here, basic statistics here. And so these statistics effectively uh, effectively consolidate the information and actually gives us quite an overview of this of how this uh, curvature distribution changes along this filtration process. So this is what we call it a uh, persistent uh, attributes or statistical attributes. And this can be, and this is what we use in our machine learning models. So what we have done is that we actually uh, consider a protein ligand uh, binding uh, application here. So what we have here is a large protein which is binded to this uh, lig uh, small ligand. And what we want to predict is the binding affinity between them. So the strength of this interaction between this ligand and this bind and this protein. And so we can construct some, we can construct simplicial complex to model these interactions and, and extract the curvature values. And what we have what we have found is that this curvature can equally perform uh, 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 as good as the TDA-based models by uh, some of these TDA-based models by outperforming uh, uh, at least 20 of these uh, traditional uh, molecular uh, descriptor models here. So here we have the Pearson correlation of, of all the models across uh, three different data sets here. These three data sets are commonly, uh, commonly used, uh, huge data banks for this uh, protein ligand uh, application. And we can see here that the red bars are, are is our model and they have outperformed the uh, rest of them. So we can, uh, we can, so apart from the curvature, we can also talk about the geometrical information that is in these uh, spectral models. So when we talk about these spectral models, we talk about Laplacians. So in particular here, we want to emphasize, we want to talk about the Hodge Laplacian because it's a, uh, which is a, uh, which is uh, both related to the TDA, which is persistent homology, and also related to the curvature. I will, I will talk more about that. So the Hodge Laplacian is basically the, the multiple, is basically co can be computed using these boundary matrices from these uh, persistent homology concepts. And so this Hodge Laplacian actually effectively uh, encodes the also similarly some kind of adjacency information and this orientation information of this uh, simplicial complex in 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 in, in this uh, matrix. And for example, the diagonal of this uh, Hodge Laplacian is the is the sum of the upper degree and the lower degree of this uh, of this. Uh, of these uh, simplices. And one of the key things in this Hodge Laplacian is that the multiplicity of these zero eigenvalues is the is essentially the Betty numbers. And and if we uh, if we take the eigenvectors corresponding to these zero eigenvalues and we illustrate them on these uh, biomolecular structures, we can actually see that the uh, the magnitude of these uh, of these values that are in these eigenvectors actually are concentrated on this uh, on the on the site on the homology structures that are in these uh, biomolecular systems. So here we can see that the darker edges are actually concentrated on this large uh, cycle in this uh, in this uh, in this uh, protein structure. And and what I want to emphasize also here is the non-homology generators. So you can consider the non-zero eigenvalues, which is also which was previously not uh, used in this persistent homology. So these non-zero eigenvalues actually provide extra information, in particular uh, geometrical information on this uh, local some of these on this local clustering information here that we have. 
So with that, we can similarly also form a persistent spectral uh, filtri based filtration process. So we can construct uh, several Hodge Laplacians and then we can obtain uh, uh, the persistent multiplicity, which is also the, which is the persistent Betty number from these uh, persistent barcodes of these uh, zero eigenvalues. But also we can also collect this uh, uh, geometrical information from this uh, uh, statistical, from these non-zero eigenvalues. And we can also subsequently uh, construct this uh, ge geometrical information from there in the form of these uh, persistent attributes. So what we have also done here is uh, we have applied this into uh, more challenging uh, applications. So here we applied this into a protein protein interactions. So one of the key difference in this application here is that we consider uh, uh, some mutation problems. So what we have is we have several protein protein uh, structures that interact between these two pro between two large proteins. And what we do is that we actually perform a, a, a mutation simulation to get a, to get a, to get a, another a mutated structure from there. So for for each protein protein structure, we actually have a, a wild, wild, wild type, which is the uh, unmutated structure, and the mutated structure, which is the which is what what we get after the simulation. And so for each of these uh, two structures, we actually can perform a persistent spectral uh, base filtration and obtain the, obtain the uh, persistent spectral uh, features. And we throw that into uh, uh, our learning models. And we also, sim we also similarly uh, uh, achieve, that, achieve a performance that is better than the traditional molecular models there. So here we can also see that the the protein protein uh, interactions actually in our model we have uh, also uh, uh, we also op we also can preserve this uh, uh, sorry let me start again so what we what what we what we get from these uh, persistent spectral features is that we can also preserve the patterns that is seen in this uh, in this diagram here. So what this diagram shows is the uh, the 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 average uh, the average predicted values and the variance of these predicted values that we that we have here. So one is the experimental, one is the predicted values, and you can see that the patterns are are quite similar. So which means that our model uh, are able to le learn it in a proper way and able to preserve these patterns while being able to maybe extrapolate uh, some of these uh, uh, the predicted values in these models. And this is uh, quite a, this is one of the starting points in, uh, prote in uh, mutation studies, I would say, because uh, for example, this um, model here in top net three, uh, Professor Wei has also worked, has also extended uh, these, uh, these models into a uh, uh, coronavirus studies. Yeah, but uh, that is more challenging and requires uh, more uh, uh, more analysis uh, along this line. So, uh, so previously I said that the Hodge Laplacian is related to the homology and also related to the formal curvature. So here I just uh, uh, I'll just br uh, briefly run through this stuff. Uh, I, I think some of some some of the experts here are already familiar with this. So the persistent spectral models from the Hodge Laplacian base is can also be can also gather the Betty numbers for season homology using from the Hodge decomposition. And you can also decompose it using this Bochner Weizenbach decomposition to obtain the formal Ricci curvature. So this also uh, achieves a Bochner Laplacian as a, as a counterpart. So, so, so all of these three invariants essentially can be summarized with this uh, diagram. These uh, family of invariants are actually related to each other, which is a nice way to put it. And so, and so uh, in, 
And so there are also other works whereby we don't change the featureization of the of the of our machine learning uh, models, but rather we change the the representation of the of this uh, molecular uh, rep, uh, in this molecular uh, uh, data analysis. So what we do is that instead of using a simplicity complex, uh, the natural way is to extend it to a hypergraph. And here, uh, and here our group has also collaborated with Professor Jiawu, and he has given a talk on uh, on uh, Monday, and also uh, introduced a super hypergraph. And so this has also led to uh, several other uh, uh, interesting representations. So uh, here I just uh, name a few. So one is the hypergraph, one is the neighborhood complex, Docker complex, uh, and to introduce a uh, new new bipartite interactions in this uh, protein vegan uh, application, and also a home complex, which actually constructs a polyhedral complex uh, between uh, two two graphs. So, so we have also uh, recently also worked in on uh, material uh, structure. So what? So one of the key differences here is that there is, uh, 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 so he, so in material structures we have a periodicity. So we have uh, so for each uh, for each uh, for each uh, material uh, uh, for each material data, we have this uh, unit cell, and this unit cell can be repeated and form this lattice structure with with different uh, 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 with different uh, ang angle inf angle based informations, and so this periodicity can result in different lattice structures uh, in this material material data. So I don't go too much into the details, but uh, this is uh, one of the key differences between uh, bio biological data and material data. But we have uh, done some work with using persistent homology and, and curvature here as, as well. So effectively, what we are building is uh, this uh, mathematical AI for molecular sciences. So we have uh, molecular structures here, all kinds of structures nowadays, material, chemistry, and biology. And we can represent them in uh, all kinds of ways, in spatial complex, in hypergraphs or super hypergraphs. And then we can also extract uh, different persistent diagrams, different uh, persistent functions as a uh, form of feature vectors here. And then we can use them in, uh, different, in different learning models to solve uh, different uh, problems. So I think my time is a, a bit too a bit early. So but I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you so much, Junji. Um, is there any question for Junji? Hello and. I have a question, and uh, yeah. so far, uh, I noticed in uh, in the application of uh, GDA in many uh, areas, and uh, I found that the higher dimensional homology, including the uh, uh, higher dimensional Laplacian, I think uh, their effects is not so uh, significant in many tasks, not only in molecular analysis. I, uh, even in the uh, uh, higher dimensional, uh, you know, a three D image, uh, recogn recognition task. So, uh, so do you think, uh, what, um, how we apply the higher dimensional um, homology information in future works? Uh, okay. Yeah, that is a good question because we, because usually in applications we, we tend to we tend to stick to the low dimensions, yeah. Uh, but we can uh. So. So uh.
So what we can so what we can, can do is that actually one of the things that we 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 have done to deal with it in this uh, biomolecular systems is actually we actually consider uh, different uh, atom subsets. So actually, what we let me go to let's see. So for example, you can see here this uh, protein ligand setting here. There are uh, there are actually there are many atoms, but uh, of a different color. So we actually uh. We actually encounter this, uh, uh, I would say, a uh, sort of a uh, computational computational complexity. I mean, in this uh, when computing a uh, Hodge Laplacian or maybe in this uh, uh, curvature uh, informations. But there, but one of the ways that we commonly use and to find it effective and one of the most important key things in our modeling modeling aspects is that we consider uh, some subsets of these atoms. So we so for example, uh, in this structure, they are basically carbon, uh, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur, atoms and stuff like that. And uh, all these atoms. So if you consider the whole, whole structure as a whole, then this, then this structure is often very large and you cannot uh, achieve, uh, you cannot achieve uh, some uh, higher dimensional uh, homology information or even geometrical information from these uh, computational, uh, from, from these uh, mathematical computations. But if you, if you actually uh, di uh, partition them and dissect them into different uh, permutations, so for example, if you only consider carbon hydrogen or carbon nitrogen or carbon oxygen or, or different, uh, tri or different uh, 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 triplets, so CHN or CHO and stuff like that, you actually effectively reduce the size of the structure that you are considering. But, but what we actually, but why is it effective? Is because uh, these, uh, these, uh, uh, these uh, connections in these uh, biomolecular uh, structures, actually, they actually uh, perform, they actually uh, react differently in the sense that uh, the carbon hydrogen bonds and the carbon nitrogen bonds actually uh, Actually, uh, actually, uh, uh, are uh, actually uh, are are reacting differently in these uh, in these uh, mechanisms in these uh, biomolecular systems. So it would be good to actually uh, characterize them by uh, by uh, uh, by splitting them into different uh, subsets, small subsets and groups, and this will allow you to be able to uh, compute uh, maybe higher dimensional homologies or geometrical information from there. But again, I think the, the, the main difficulty will be in this interpretability of these uh, higher dimensional homologies because uh, in this uh, biomolecular uh, bioinformatics or this chemi chemo inf chemical informatics or material informatics, what, we, what, 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 uh, what, what uh, many of them are actually interested in is this in, in this physical meaning. So whether can you, can, can, are you able to translate this into some uh, structural property relationship with, directly from these, uh, from these uh, persistent functions? So that is, that is, uh, that is something that, is, uh, uh, st uh, that is still remains a challenge, but, uh, but then I think we are still constantly working on it and exploring further. Okay, thank you. Is there any other question for Junji? Uh, maybe, maybe I can ask another one. Is um, I I noticed that uh, you use the Hodge Laplacian to uh, detect the uh, significance of uh, such as loop structures. And you, you use the darker uh, car EAS this slide. And uh, I mean, uh, so far in our uh, TDA scheme, we usually uh, extract features from uh, such, a, uh, such a point cloud and uh, we uh, reduct the point cloud as a factor and uh, input them into machine learning models. But uh, uh, so if we include, uh, Include the computational com 
complexity. So is it meaningful to uh, input this kind of heat map into a new machine learning model and uh, and we can get local uh, heat information of the whole molecules. And uh, is it uh, possible for a uh, future study? And uh, is it a uh, feature uh, use useful for the other tasks? Uh, if I understand the question correctly, is you want to you want to consider this eigenvector information as a as a more of like a image representation? Yes, I. Representation stuff. Yes, I also want to uh, encode the uh, heat map a uh, heat of local regions and uh, then we can know the location of the loops and the location of uh, the links parts and uh, is this information useful for uh, uh, such as uh, bio uh, biomolecular uh, tasks? Uh, yes, I think that would be that Yes, that will be that will be in interest. That will be useful. Uh, uh, we have we have we have actually started to uh use this uh uh this uh homology generated information in some of the other in another work uh uh which is completely different from this in uh in trying to uh do this uh trying to create trying to uh, use this to uh, compute some new metric or or something like the host of distance and things like that in this into in 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 comparing between uh, two the two different uh, biomolecular structures and things like that but uh but uh yeah but i have not but i've not used it in the maybe in some kind of heat rep heat map representation or image representation but I think that that will be that will be useful in maybe in in maybe some of these uh I'll think that it will be useful in some of these uh, non homology generator however because this homology generator is more of this uh go uh, more of this uh, homology information so it's on these loop structures and things like that but if you were to take this heat map of this uh, non homology generator then you will be able to concentrate and emphasize on this uh, on this uh, local clustering if, uh, information and i think that that may be able to uh, be be of help in maybe some other uh, some other applications yeah but yeah, i cannot i am able to name that yeah okay thank you thank you uh, are there any more questions for junji Thank you, Junji. That was a very interesting talk.